Good evening everybody and welcome to tonight's special edition of On The Sofa. I've got the great pleasure of having Paul Caddis on. Um, you know it's one I've been waiting for for a long time. Um, so without further ado, let's bring on Vic. Hey Vic. Chris, a very good evening to you. You've got some important news regarding the Stratton Bank on Saturday. We have, we have, yes. So the Stratton Bank will be open on Saturday um, at the price of £10, um, £9 for seniors and then um, kids are a pound and then I think it's under 18s and under 21s are not eight and seven and eight um, or something like that. So a bargain. So if you haven't got a ticket, please do rock up, um, give the uh, bit of atmosphere on the bank. Um, the Trust and the Supporters Club have um, jointly funded uh, the opening of the bank. Uh, because we think it's so valuable that we get that extra support and noise coming from there. So um, we have uh, we have helped the club by by doing that. And plus, it's at the last minute as well. So, so yes, yeah, so if you haven't got your ticket, um, please do think about uh, going long and standing on the bank or sitting on the bank, sorry, because there's seats. Um, so, yes, so there you go. Uh, just one other thing, Tuesday night, um, excellent brilliant, wonderful, um, all the other words that you can put together with that. Um, but particularly thank you very much for everybody who observed the minutes applause for Link. Um, mm. I know his family were there um, and they were deeply comforted by um, the support that they got from the club as a whole, um, especially with Dion going around with the um, shirt at the end and everything, which was... Uh, yeah, that was a lovely moment. And actually, it was lovely to see all the players join in briefly. Yes. Yes. Uh, and the Forest Green Rovers fans. Yeah. So it's a, a, yeah, yes. Both, yeah. And both managers uh, and everything. So it was, um, it yeah. brought a bit of comfort to them in this very, very difficult time. So, right. Let's get Mr. Caddis on. Good evening, Paul. How are we doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm okay. How are you? Yeah, I'm not bad. Not bad at all. Thank you. Good. Good. Right. So, any uh, comments for Paul? Please put them in the um, uh, on the comments boxes. We'll get through as many as we can as usual. Um, as I say, if we don't get through them all, um, I will send them to Paul so he can he can see what um, what a wonderful person he was, and uh, so, <laughs> and is and is <laughs> and is and is yeah, of course. Speaking in past tense, yeah, <laughs> well, you were for us, and now you're just you're just wonderful anyway. Right, I'm going before I embarrass myself even more, so <laughs> I'll leave you to it, and I'll speak to you. Later. Chris, thanks very much indeed. Uh, very nice to see you, Paul. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, I know you had to reschedule at the last minute last time, so we're delighted that you're with us uh, today, especially today, because if you can see behind me, there are uh, there's a, a group of photographs on a, about a very special day, 10 years ago today. Can you believe it, the day you lifted the League Two trophy? Unbelievable, isn't it? Time flies. It's, what a day that was. Uh, everything. Amazing. Yeah, everything amazing. even had the sunshine and everything, it was unbelievable. Yeah, and a fantastic performance as well. Yeah, the performance was just the icing on the cake, wasn't it? I remember one of the goals in particular. I remember I think Matty scored an unbelievable goal, but I remember one with the Paul Benson goal, if you remember the mm. little flip for Sai and the dink over the goalie for Benno. And yeah, everything just seemed to click in that one day. Yeah, what a wonderful season. We'll talk about it a bit later, of course, but lots to talk about regarding your career. And uh, what a career. Um, now, you can help me out here because you were born in Irvine, I think, in Scotland, which has a, an incredible sort of Gaelic way of saying it. Do you know how to say that? Yeah, it's Irvin. Irvin. Irvin, yeah. Pure <laughs> yeah, Scottish okay. Irvin. Yeah, I was born in Irvin, but it's just the, that was the maternity hospital at the time. I'm, I'm obviously from, I'm from Kilmarnock, but the maternity hospital was in, in, uh, in Irvin, yeah. And, and you come from a footballing family, don't you? I mean, a lot of your brothers played football too. Yeah, my older brother was at Allo Athletic. Uh, his area United has played senior football. My younger brother's played uh, with St Johnston, Allo Athletic as well. But actually, my younger brother was in the Scottish Cup squad when St Johnston won the Scottish Cup. They were He was... In the Europa League campaign with St Johnson, he's played in Europa League. He's played at Celtic Park. He scored at Celtic Park, which reminds me every day because I've never scored at Celtic Park. Uh, and my youngest was a goalkeeper at Kilmarnock, right through the youth system. Uh, went on to play for Clyde for a bit as well. So yeah, all footballers, 
Yeah, so was it always football for you? I mean, it sounds a daft question now, bearing in mind what you said, but yeah. was it all kicking about in the back garden, that kind of thing? Always 24 hours a day, especially. With, so me and my brother, my brother's three years older than me, then there's a gap between me and my two youngest. My my younger brother's five years between us, and then there's two years between my younger two. So uh, it was me and my older brother. Uh, must have smashed about 25 ornaments in the house, but... <laughs> Yeah, I used to just constantly kick a ball about, always had a ball at our feet. And so was, was your desire to be a footballer, was there anything else in your life or was it just about getting to be a footballer? No, I think when I was younger, if you ask most young kids that enjoy football, I think that's what it is. But interestingly, actually, my, one of my first couple of games for uh, when I was younger in the, the boys' clubs, I, I bust my whip and, I, and it frightened me and I didn't go back for like 18 months, two years, so... I didn't play football between like the age of five and eight because I was I went through a, a tough time because I got a bust lip and I was all terrified and that. But yeah, listen, it's always been football. Always, it's never been anything else. So, what about your boyhood club then? I mean, Kilmarnock, you've mentioned, but was it always Celtic? Yeah, Celtic. Yeah, my obviously my, my parents, my, my dad was a big Celtic supporter. My my papa as well was a big Celtic supporter. So yeah, it's just it's always been Celtic. Uh, the area I'm from is actually predominantly Rangers. It's it's not a it's not a big Celtic uh, fan base there at all. So it was predominantly Rangers, but uh, yeah, it's always been Celtic. That was my my boyhood club. So you'll be keeping an eye on Rangers later on tonight, I guess, in the Europa Cup. I will be. Yeah, uh, tough game for them. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, very tough. But they've done really well in Europe, to be honest. Really well. Just look, they're absolutely knackered for the weekend, and then Celtic are going to win eventually tie up the league. <laughs> Fair enough. So when the boys eventually come in for you, then what was that like? I was at Rangers. I was at I was at Rangers from under twelves to under uh, under thirteens, under fourteens, and I absolutely loved it. Loved it. There was uh, there was no pressure. It was like playing with your mates. There was no real focus on coaching. It was like just enjoyment and stuff like that. And I was playing for my school team at the same uh, at the time. Uh, and when you were younger, if you played for Celtic in the youth development from the ages, well, secondary school ages, so from the ages of 12 to 16, they didn't allow you to play with your school team. So eventually Celtic had called me and asked me to go and train. I went and trained. I absolutely hated it, but I loved Celtic. Hated it, but... And then straight after the first training session, they asked me to sign. I felt under pressure, so I signed. Went home, I was crying to my dad. My dad's like, listen, well, We'll sort it out and that. So, but I just stuck with it. But I'll be honest, from 14, 15, 16, uh, 14, 15 at Celtic, it was a, it was very serious. It was a, a lot more coaching predominantly. Couldn't play with my school team, which I was I was de- devastated at. at. Uh, leaving Rangers was was uh, was difficult for me because because I loved it. I got close with a lot of the players there. I was still playing school football, uh, so that was one of the biggest disappointments for me not being able to play school football but listen didn't look back since then well you clearly stuck with it um so when did you begin to enjoy it at, at probably just the year before i went full time so probably around about the under 15s stage uh started enjoying it more just probably it was just me getting over that hurdle of understanding which i think is right like i'm at the age of 14 15 i've got to now start learning the game it's not about just enjoying it if I want to make the next step it's going to be to, to it's going to be my job so I'm going to have to my next step is playing competitive football with at under 16s level still learning the game but you've got to have a little bit of background to you so uh, it's probably me just getting over that stumbling block of no nah, it's time to get serious now I need to understand the game better and so probably the ages of 15 and then then my first year full time was obviously when I got offered that contract it was a dream come true so uh, and how much would that help you now? Because obviously you are moving into coaching and you'll be coaching, you know, kids of that age. And yeah. so presumably that that experience will help you with them, will it? Yeah, it's exactly that. That's exactly that. That's the age I'm, I'm coaching in the, the now with Fleetwood at under 16s. And believe it or not, I actually had this chat with a couple of the, the, the boys just Monday night about you've got to have that mix so you've got to enjoy it, but you can only enjoy it by doing the things that you you love doing, so you work hard, your, your desire, your determination. But if you don't work hard, you don't have desire, you don't, you're not determined. 
you won't enjoy football as much because you won't get success out of it. So it's just trying to pass that message on to them. And, and I actually told that story as well about when I was younger, I played at, at Rangers, went to Celtic, didn't enjoy it, but it was more me having to get over those hurdles out in front of me. Yeah, interesting. And and obviously those experiences in life help us, don't they, as we go on. And you eventually did sort of make your way through the ranks. Uh, how competitive is it at Celtic? I know it's a daft question because I'm guessing most of the boys in Scotland want to join Celtic or Rangers. So how competitive was it? Yeah, it's extremely competitive. If It's installed in you very early, at an early age at Celtic, that winning is the only op- it's the only scenario. A draw isn't as a defeat, losing's the end of the world. So that's the, the stature of the club. That's the pressure you've got to live with. Hence why like when we were 16, 17 year old, we were going through things like media training, uh, to try and prep us for the first team. Uh a lot of like awareness courses and stuff like that and just about winning. Everything was based around winning football. Uh the pressures of being 17, 18 year old, you're expected to win the 18s league, you're expected to win the 19s league, you should be winning the reserve league and obviously the first team expect to win the, their league. So everything just filters down from the first team. It was, it was one of those ones where if the first team had, had lost on the Saturday, we had won on the Sunday, the place was still in a downer by the Monday. So it was regardless of what the youth team done, it just filtered down. So uh, it was tough at times, but listen, as you touched on earlier, it set me up for the rest of my career. Like, going through with that high expectation, the high standards. You, uh, you're playing against, sometimes you play against, it's, it's a cliche, you play against 11 men, but sometimes you're playing against 11 men and you're playing against all the expectation that you've got. So you're up against that. You're up against, listen, under the 17s, under the 18s, you're up against your opponents, but you're also up against your teammates because it's, it's dog eat dog. Mm. We all want to get to the same place and there's not very many slots available, so to speak. So, it's like you've got to do the best you possibly can and sometimes you've got to be selfish and, and knock people out of the way if that's what it takes. Yeah, um, obviously moving through the ranks at Celtic and getting to the first team, it's not, you know, it's an old walk in the park, is it? So when you get that opportunity to play in the first team, how does that feel? Oh, well, first of all, I was a massive Celtic fan, so it was it was literally a dream come true for me. I uh, So I started training with them Occasionally, like maybe once, twice a week, uh, when I was about 17, 18. And then that was, it was actually one of my first training sessions was just before Roy Keane came in to the club. Uh, so you just start training with the first team and then it becomes more of a regular thing. You start getting involved in the, the first team squad. I was, I was traveling on the, the first, in the first team bus for about a year, maybe. And I sat, I literally sat outside the toilet where the stairs are. Didn't have a seat on the bus, and I was just making teas. I was making coffees. I was bringing the food to the players. I was, I was still cleaning their boots. Uh, I moved into the first team dressing room when I was nineteen. I would go out. I'd train. I'd be a proper first team player. I'd be treated like a first team player. But the difference was when I finished training, I went in and cleaned all the boys that I had just trained with, all their boots. I never stopped any of that until I was told to stop it. It's just the attitude I had. It's how I was brought up with the likes of. Tommy Burns was my mentor at the time, uh, and that's just that's just the attitude I always had. I always had it's, his motto was it's very difficult to become a Celtic football player, but it's even more it's very difficult to become a Celtic first team player, but it's even more difficult to stay there. Mm-hmm. And always I had that in my head. So what got me there? So stick to what what I'm doing, try and get better at it. Yeah, I would imagine not the shadow of the Lisbon Lions, but the example of the Lisbon Lions must have been well and truly over the football club because of course they were local boys weren't they I, I, yeah. I forget the statistic but they all came from within at a certain distance of the ground yeah nine of them were, were within a mile of the of the stadium one of them was seven miles away uh in motherwell and another one was just over 25 30 miles away in Salcot. so yeah listen i got really close with one of the, the lisbon lines and john clark who was the first team kit man so he was there every day and we worked so what happened is when, when you're a youth team player, you always had four people working at training. So we had to, before the first, uh, before we would train at like half 10. So from half eight till 10 o'clock, we'd be in with John Clark, the kit men. Two, two would do boots, two would do all the kit. So we worked really, all, all the young lads worked really closely with, with Clarky. So yeah, so seeing that and listening to his stories every single day was was 
awe-inspiring to be honest. It was it was unbelievable. And you just think how football's changed, obviously, from even back then to to back in the sixties when when they won the European Cup in nineteen sixty seven. So yeah, constantly seeing him every day is was was a reminder of how great the football club is. Yeah, well, I'm old enough to have remembered watching that game on Thursday tea time. I think uh, what an incredible game it was because Milan yeah. scored first, didn't they? And yeah, they did. Eh? Celtic battered and battered and battered, and Tommy Gemmell, I think Steve Chalmers. Steve Chalmers uh, what yeah. a what an amazing turnaround and what an amazing night! Incredible. Yeah, I can imagine so. Yeah. Uh, so there we are. You get to to pull on the first team shirt then eventually, um, and of course uh, you do play play famously against Barcelona. Everybody asks you about that, but that is a, a keynote thing to do. Let's be honest. That great Barcelona team. Yeah. So my first. Time- actual appearance with the first team was a way to Falkirk, the first, first competitive one. But I was meant to start, so the Barcelona game was the Tuesday or the Wednesday, Wednesday night. We had a game on the Sunday uh, against Motherwell, and I was I was meant to start, so that was going to be my first start. But on the way to the game, the game was called off due to a waterlogged pitch. So I was thinking, I've missed my chance. That's me, I've missed my chance. Playing against Barcelona on Wednesday night. The gaffer's never going to play him against him. We had uh, Mark Wilson, who was back fit, who was on the bench for the Motherwell game. So I'm thinking I might get 60 minutes in this, this game. They'll bring Mark Wilson on the last half an hour to prep him for the game on Tuesday, Wednesday night. But then that passed. We went into training Monday. Nothing was said. No team shape. Nothing went into training Tuesday. Done a little bit of team shape. And I was at right back for two out of the three team shapes. And I... And I'm telling myself, I think as a manager, just playing mind games with me, because that's what Gordon Strachan was like. He would constantly have you, he was constantly testing you. So I'm thinking, there's no chance. We'd done uh, some set pieces on Wednesday, and I was involved in them, but so was Mark Wilson. So was another couple of players, like 14, 15 players involved. And it wasn't until we got to the stadium, so about half, about 6.15, he named the team, and I was starting. And I just obviously couldn't believe it. The closest I got to these guys, I remember saying, to my brothers, the closest I've ever got to these guys is on, like, the PlayStation. That's me being brutally honest. But, listen, in fact, I'm never hand on heart. I never get nervous at football. Never, always. I was just brought up with, like, my came from, like, good parents and that. There's, there's worse things in life than yeah. losing a game of football. Do you know what I mean? Especially, listen, now more than ever, we're through a pandemic for 18 yeah. months, two years, people losing lives left, right and centre. So, yeah. I always had that mindset and I always... In my head, I always said, listen, it could be worse. I could be a surgeon doing a heart transplant here. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's not life or death, whereas their life and death, these are the people that should feel the pressure. I'm yeah. going out to try and make 60,000 people happy. Yeah, I might not do it. Yeah, I might do it, but they're all going home safe. Do you know what I mean? I always had that mindset, and that's what lived with me from my full career. So I wasn't nervous at all standing in the, the tunnel. I was actually excited. And I, I think that's the difference now. Nowadays, there's a lot of pressure put on. I was like, I was 18, 19 years of age. There's was, was a lot of pressure now with social media and stuff like that with kids, and they don't get the chance to enjoy it. Whereas I thoroughly enjoyed that night. I'm thinking, this is absolutely amazing. Well, let me read you some of the names in that team uh, Valdez, Poyel, Iniesta, Yaya Torre, Deco, Messi, Henri, Ronaldinho, uh, and, on, uh, yeah, and Henri. I mean, that's, you know, that's not a bad list, is it? I mean, that's no. quite a decent team, isn't it? Oh, it was, honestly, it was unbelievable. I think it's been said from a lot of people like that's the best Barcelona team that's came to Celtic Park. And Celtic, weirdly, like, always seem to draw Barcelona in the Champions League. So so that's coming from like previous teams that have played there over the last 10, 15 years. But oh, they were unbelievable. We, we took the lead and we are doing all right. But uh, yeah, just going back to... I'm, like we're doing set pieces in the in the dressing room beforehand, and it's like like Kaji will be on the post, but if if Ronaldinho peels here, and I'm thinking he's just said my name beside Ronaldinho, <laughs> and Messi if Messi takes it, if Messi takes it that side, you take Messi. If he takes it this side, then I'm thinking I wonder if Messi and Ronaldinho's in that dressing room worrying about little Paul Cardis. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does sound fantastic, and yeah. what an experience! I mean, you mentioned you know life has perspective, but Hey, there are worse things than being on a football pitch along these alongside these fellas, isn't there? Exactly. I know, I know. And I just I just drove myself to make sure like I enjoy this. Like this is a hopeful I was obviously at the time I was hoping there'd be more occasions like that, but I just knew that 
listen, there's no pressure on me whatsoever. I'm an inexperienced fullback. If I do well, it's like he's done unbelievable. If I don't do well, then I've, I'm an inexperienced fullback, so to speak. But uh, I've done all right. I played 60, 60, 65 minutes, and I'll always live by a come off at two each, Vic, and we lost three two. <laughs> <laughs> well, why wouldn't you? Um, there are lots of messages coming in, and, and uh, I'll read you one or two now, but one, one or two of them refer to things later on in, in your career, which we'll get to. But this yeah. is from Joe Caddish, you wee legend. Um, and Greg says, could you uh, wish my partner Gail a happy 50th birthday for tomorrow? So if you can just do that now. That's yeah, happy 50th birthday, Gail. Many happy returns. Hope you have a good day. Yeah, I, I remember 50. It was a long, long time ago. Now, um, <laughs> uh, let's let's talk about, um, you know, when you come to leave Celtic. Cause I, I, I read a very interesting article. Um, the, uh, an interview with you um, this afternoon. I was looking through some of the articles that you've been involved in and you were talking about a young player who was about to leave Celtic and you said how difficult it was because obviously you're at one of the great clubs in the world, right? And you have to make this decision whether you stay there or whether you leave to further your career. How difficult was that? Uh, it was made more difficult by... So Neil Lennon took over as I was leaving and Neil Lennon had was the reserve manager at the time, so I'd played a lot of reserve games, and Neil Lennon had offered me a new two-year contract to stay at Celtic, so it made it more difficult, but I got to a stage in my life that I wanted to be a... I wanted to be a footballer, and I don't mean that, like, I was a footballer there, but I wanted to make a career for myself, so I wanted to play regularly, I wanted to feel all the benefits of playing every single week. I got a little bit of that when I went to the D United for four months on loan, and I loved it, and I've seen a lot of players going through the system at Celtic that had 23, 24, and they hadn't had any games behind them. And they were leaving and they were moving on to lower league teams in Scotland. And that's me, without me being disrespectful. I wanted to I wanted to go and try and make a career for myself. So it was a massive gamble. It was a lot like financially, it was a lot less. It was moving away from home. It was uh, moving obviously down to a club like Swindon that I didn't I'll be honest I didn't know anything about except from from what Cy Ferry and Scott Cuthbert were telling me so it was a huge risk massive risk like it wasn't a footballing risk it was more like off field stuff like I'd never lived on my own and it sounds silly but I was like 22 year old I'd never paid my own bills and just stuff like that I had to start thinking of all those kind of things like just to become a, a man I suppose uh, moving out of my parents house and uh, but yeah, it was really difficult because I was a massive Celtic fan, loved it. I could have easily sat there, got all the best of training gear, got all the all the free boots, going to all the... I travelled for three years in the Champions League, going to all these different stadiums, training the night before in all these amazing grounds. But yeah, that was great, but it wasn't enough for me. I wanted to... I'd rather, I'd rather play it, be all due respect, all the shot away than train in the San Siro on a Monday night for to go and watch a game on a Tuesday. I wanted, I wanted to be a part of something. I felt a part of it, but I wanted to, to put my stamp on my own career. Well, I think it's fair to say you might have put your stamp on the county ground more than once uh, 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 in terms of Swindon Town. Uh, that's an incredible attitude because many, I think it's fair to say there might be some footballers who are quite happy to hang around with a two-year contract at Celtic and, you know, comfortable living, as you say, playing, you know, great facilities, all that kind of thing. But uh, that clearly wasn't you. No, listen, no, it wasn't. I'm not trying to make myself to be this shining light, but I was brought up like many players, like in a council estate, and it was never in, football was never about money for me. And I don't think I know everyone goes on about oh he's doing it for the money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, about different players, but people forget that you first fall in love with football when you're five, six, seven, eight years of age. You don't think about getting thousands of pounds and getting all these nice cars. The only thing you think about at that age is playing in front of supporters, scoring goals, being in winning teams, picking trophies up, getting all the accolades that come with it. So I still had that and I actually spoke, I was asked to speak to the lads at Fleetwood uh, not long ago about my career and stuff like that. And that, that was the one thing I mentioned. I never ever lost that. I loved football. Like I was never interested in the massive financial package that supposedly comes with it all. And not as you said, I could have easily sat there with all those unbelievable facilities, but I just had that work ethic in me that I wanted to go and go and test myself. 
Well, um, you said you didn't know much about Swindon Town, and why would you? Um, you know, there's not a lot of English, there's a lot of English fans who don't know a lot about a Scottish club. So, yeah, you know, there, there, there's no reason why. But uh, Danny Wilson, I think, has been looking at you for a while, hadn't he? And you mentioned Simon Ferry and Scott Cuthbert. How, how important was that Scottish connection on your decision to join? Oh, it was almost everything because I, I didn't know Danny Wilson. I didn't know any of the lads at all. Only knew Sai, who I was really close to, who I trusted, obviously. And I know Sai wouldn't have just said, just basically come to keep me company. It was never like that. It was like, the manager's unbelievable. The players are, it's a great dressing room. The Obviously, I had uh, Scott Cuthbert there as well, who I knew really well. So it was more, uh, I'll be honest, it was Sai was the one that, that kind of got me there but at the same time I knew it was it was a step in the right direction for me uh, I wanted to go and as I, as I said go and play play games of football I was never promised that but I knew I had a better chance uh, and once I'd spoke to Danny Wilson uh, things had changed and I was I was desperate to come I think uh, we were in Australia with, with Celtic at the time in pre-season and obviously me, my, me and Si were sharing a room and it was ongoing and at the time when in Scotland, so if you were under 23, you couldn't leave for free. So they had to try and agree a fee and stuff like this. So, and I remember the owner at the time at Swindon had, had came to one of the pre-season games we were at and I managed to get a chat with, with him, which was, for me, I'm thinking, that's amazing. Like he's desperate to get me in here. He's shown a real interest. So yeah, it was definitely something that by the end I was desperate to do. So you do arrive at Swindon. I mean, Danny Wilson, I, I, I had a lot of dealings with him um, when he was there. A really genuine man. I always found him a really decent bloke. And yeah. how was he as a football manager? Yeah, I absolutely loved loved him. Lo absolutely loved him. He, Danny Wilson would give you everything if, as long as you give him everything back. He was very fair. He, uh, I think it was unfortunate the way it ended with him. Mm. Uh, mm. But... Yeah, there, was, there wasn't a player in the dressing room that would ever point the finger at, at the gaffer and say he was the reason we got relegated that year. It was it was, it was was literally down to the dressing room. We didn't have a strong enough dressing room. And ultimately, weren't good enough in the end. But no, I loved him. I loved working under him. He was uh, very honest. He just wanted hard work. He was uh, very fair. But yeah, really, really enjoyed working under him. Yeah, and I... I... You know, I put my head above the parapet now and say some of the stick he got in, in when he came back with other clubs. So it was grossly unfair, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so when you say it wasn't a strong dressing room, what, what do you mean by that? Were there certain factions within it? I think, you know, it did all seem to fall apart after the, you know, the the success of or the relative success of the previous season. It just didn't seem to gel somehow. It didn't. Work. No, see, I, I was obviously coming down for that success. Yeah. That's what I was coming. Like, like Sai had said, we've just missed out. In the getting promoted next year will we'll definitely be up there, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I was coming down with all that hope and stuff like that. And uh, Listen, we just lost too many games of football. With Everyone talks about having consistency and, and stuff like that, but consistency can go both ways. We were consistently losing games of football and end up, but it was obviously, I think it's been well publicised now, it was, it was a difficult dressing room. We had French lads that would stick together, we had English lads that would stick together, we had other lads that would maybe stick together and then those groups maybe would, wouldn't quite get on with each other, uh, which made it more difficult. But I was new in the dressing room, so I, I was quite open-minded to to everyone. I, I didn't see it at first, I'll be honest, I didn't probably see it till after Christmas until like you actually start seeing like at lunch there'll be a group that will constantly sit together, the other ones will constantly sit together. You've got a group of these friends that will just constantly sit together, which is normal that didn't help on the pitch for, for us in that particular year. Was there any way that could have been broken? I mean, you know, in any walk of life, if there are little cliques, it's very difficult to break it down. Yeah. But was there any way that could have been broken down or not? Or was that just that that was the way it was? Uh, I think the only way you could break it down is by getting, by breaking that circle of friends, or so to speak. You've just got to be probably down to the, the club and the manager to have a look and see who he thinks is most causing most problems in the dressing room and break that circle up by you'd have to get rid of players and to get rid of players you'd have to pay contracts up etc so I don't know how easy it is behind the scenes but that would be the only way of, way of doing it 
Well, Danny does dis- uh, disappear eventually, and I think with, by mutual agreement, I think it was that he he left. I think it was in March, if I remember rightly. Then in comes Paul Hart, who I have to say I had my two little run-ins with uh, when interviewing him. How how was he uh, for you? Uh, for me personally, he was all right because he liked me as a player. But listen, it was yeah, he, he brought in a few strange signings quite early and. I remember, I think he brought this centre mid in from Palace. Was it in Dai? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And like in training and stuff like that, we could, like he was missing like very simple passes and stuff like that. And we were just starting to think like, what's, what's going on here? <laughs> kind of thing. And yeah, it wasn't, I don't think he quite got the Swindon fans. Uh, he didn't go on a, on a good start with them and it made it more difficult for, for us on the pitch. It was as if he was con he was in a constant battle with the supporters and uh yeah it was difficult. It was very difficult under under uh, Paul Hart at times. He brought in a, a Scottish assistant as well. Uh but yeah I think there's not really much I could say about that. It's, it was done. It was put it this way we didn't quite get the you know when a new manager comes in you get that little bit that little jump and we, we didn't quite get that. No, um, it's fair to say. I think uh, there was one win at Brentford, if I seem to remember, towards the end of the season. But that was it, about it for 18, 19 games or something. It was a terrible run, wasn't it? Yeah, I think we lost we lost Charlie as well, didn't we? We lost yeah, Charlie. Did, yeah. I think Charlie dislocated his shoulder. And with all due respect, he's had a great career. But we ended up with like Vinny Pericard and Thomas De Seve as our two strikers. And it was difficult. So, listen, if we conceded a lot of goals. But if you're not going to, con- if you're not going to score any, then... It makes life a lot tougher. So, losing Charlie was a huge blow for us. Huge blow. Uh, not replacing him. I think we tried. I think the manager brought in was it Paul Hart that brought in came from Leeds striker American. Uh, you know what I'm on about? Yeah, Grella brought yeah. in like Grells and and a couple of a couple of other players that couldn't quite fill the void. We ended up trying to bring four, five, six different players in to just cover for what for losing Charlie. Mm, which is, you know, I, I've said before that I think he's the greatest natural goal scorer I've ever seen play for Swindon. So not yeah. easy one to replace, you know. Simple. Oh, of that course, really. I know. And it was it was difficult that year as well because Matty, who obviously Matt Ritchie, who obviously went on had an unbelievable career and still is, uh, wasn't playing every week. He wasn't regular every week as well, and it was just a lack of confidence right through the group. We had uh, I think David Ball was in as well, and mm. we just had players that were constantly lacking confidence when you're lacking confidence in you so think they're losing you, when you when you talk about confidence it's often said in football that confidence is a very important part of the game but what do you mean about that is it the fact that you think every Saturday you know you might get beat or you might win I mean we're going to talk about the, the following season very shortly but yeah, I, I guess that's chalk and cheese isn't it you've got that one season where you're on a terrible run the next season the sun comes out you know everything's fantastic yeah. so what is it with confidence and as a footballer? So for me, I can just, I can go on my own personal. So I, I, I never lost confidence until last season. It's the first time I feel clear. It's, I didn't feel confident. What I meant by that was I was doing things on the pitch that I had never done before. My body position, my, my distribution on the ball, my touch on the ball. It was all off and I had never experienced this before and I'm, what, 33 when I'd played that last season at Swindon and that was the first time in my career and I'm thinking this isn't right this isn't me am I is this me deteriorating now as a player and it was just confidence I was going in I was tr- still training properly but it was just things that wasn't quite t- wasn't quite there and I don't know if it just comes through losing games of football but I think personally I, I lost my confidence in, in that particular year and trying to put it into words is difficult but that's the best I can describe it. I was playing passes that I've played for 15, 16 years in my full career that were absolute bankers for me, like wrapping it into the striker, down the side. And I couldn't execute them anymore. So the more I was trying it, the less I was executing it and the more confidence I was losing. Because mm. those were like my... Every player will have a go-to, like a minimum like standard and, and I was dropping below them every week and it was getting more and more frustrated I was probably overthinking things so then I then became tense in games because I'm thinking make sure this touch is right make sure this touch is right make sure this touch is right and it'll go astray and I'm like start getting frustrated myself and 
it's just a number of things. So frustration, uh, concentration, everything that just goes. It's just it's like if you can imagine like a a graph, and it's just constantly dipping and dipping and dipping and dipping with every little thing you do. And before you get there, it's empty, and you're like you've just lost everything. And then, do you try too hard? Um, yeah, hundred percent. You try too hard. Hundred yeah. percent. You. So if that one into the striker is not on, you'll then think, right, well, I can play the bigger one into the second striker and you'll overhit it or you'll underhit it or you'll you'll mispass it. And, yeah, you start then trying things that you know that you've never been able to do, mm. regardless of what age you are. Like, you then start, like, for me, I'd start to try and take on full, like opposition fullbacks, which I've never done. I've always passed and moved. With, I've always been clever in the head. I start up losing that. And, yeah, you start overdoing everything. Overthinking everything. Yeah, one one or two um, comments have come in uh, regarding last season, and uh, Sean says lost confidence last season. Was it Sheridan? And Tony says, do you think that was with Sheridan's coaching, or was it just a natural thing? How would you describe it? No, it was just wasn't it comes with losing games of football as well. Uh, see, I think if it was just me had lost confidence, I'd have got through it because of the ten other players round about me. But see, when everyone else is starting to lose confidence, it's it's like a poison chalice. It just spreads. Mm. So if one player's starting to lose it, like I know for a fact that there'd be younger players last year, and I'm not blowing smoke up my backside, but would have looked at me and thought he's starting. Maybe not, but that's probably me being self-critical. But probably looking at me and think, well, if he's losing confidence, he's had a half decent career. He's mm. done well at this club. He's got a great relationship with supporters, etc. He's done. So the successful times here, if he's losing confidence, then what am I thinking? Like, then I'm thinking to myself, those 22, 21-year-olds must have think, God, just losing confidence. We're knackered, so to speak, if you know what I mean. So I then probably took that burden on me too much as well, thinking I might have been an example to these players, but how can I be an example when I'm putting performances in like that? So I probably took too much on, but that was just what I always done it. Mm. Especially at Swindon when I was made like captain and things like that. I always like last year I wasn't captain, but I felt as if I was one of the older ones. I had been there before, I was one of the experienced ones. So just trying to take so try to hide my my lack of confidence by taking someone else's problems on, basically. So is there a moment when you think that's it, I know that's it. I mean I'm not I don't wanna yeah, you know, I'm gonna get to the upsides in a minute. No, I'm, that's fine. I'm really intrigued with this because does there then come a moment when you think, okay, I've got to move on. Is, it, is that is that the moment, do you think? Yeah. Uh, as I said, I'd never experienced... Like, I did, I've experienced playing bad games. I've never experienced having a constant lack of confidence. So I wish I would have, maybe at 21, 20 years of age, and then I'd have understood it more. But hmm. being this seasoned pro at 33 years, years of age, I couldn't get my head around it. So, yeah, I probably did. See, if it happened five, six years ago, I wouldn't have thought, Am I, is this my time up here in this game? Am I finished? Whereas because I'm at 33, you then start getting all the, the doubts in your mind. You know what it's like now in football, that you, you get to the age of 30, you're an old man. So you then start believing that because you're losing confidence. And then I started telling myself, is this time up? And, but uh, yeah, it was a sad way. Listen, I'll never retire. I'm one of those determined ones. I'll never retire. Listen, I've not played for, for six months, but rest assured, i I'll be coming back to play football. I, I miss it too much. And whether that's playing with guys that are staying the same street as or whether it's playing semi-professional or, or professional, I'm definitely, definitely something I'm looking at. Fantastic. Uh, well, we love seeing you play and, you know, you mean a lot to Swindon fans. And I, I got what you're saying and I, I can understand it. But from a Swindon fan's point of view, you know, top bloke. Uh, simple as that, really. Um Right, we'll get to the Swindon bits in a minute, but there's another highlight of your career I wanted to touch on before we get to the, the Swindon years, and that's Birmingham City. Now, you are a blues legend, particularly for one moment, and I think the moment you know I'm going to talk about, the goal that was so important yeah. to Birmingham City. Take us through that goal and, and what it meant to the club. Oh, well, the club was... There was a lot of problems at the club behind the scenes. We... Uh, so basically, Lee Clark was was tasked to to make up make up a team of League One and League Two players to try and stay in the Championship against all these obviously high profile clubs. Uh, Leeds Leeds winning the, the the league at the time. There was, oh, there was several others, Fulham, etc. So 
we uh, we were up against it from from the get go. Uh, but yeah, that that last game of the season, it was one of those things where we we knew we needed at least a point, but we needed uh, Doncaster to lose. In fact, Richard Williams was playing with Doncaster at the time, so uh, I've reminded him plenty of times that I, I was a part of relegating him. Uh, so. The the night before actually the night before we Lee Clark had called called a team meeting, uh, gave us the team, etc. And then they shouted out about nine or ten players to stay behind. I was one of those nine, ten players. And we're all looking at each other and thinking, what's what's going on here? So what Lee Clark had done in the build up to this game, because he knew it was it was a massive game, we had uh, we had the chairman basically putting massive pressure on us, which was was probably harsh. Lee Clark was, was fuming at it. He was telling us that if we don't stay up, we're going to, people are going to lose their jobs at this club, which we knew, but that wasn't down to us. It was down to the, the mismanagement behind the scenes. But but anyway, so Lee Clark in the build-up had uh, contacted all everyone's families, uh, so partners, mums, dads, etc., through the, the club secretary. Uh, and only nine had got back, so it was like everyone had done little personal messages for the partner, their son. So it was like my partner, my two kids were like, uh, we're so proud of you, etc. The Jonathan Spector, who'd not seen his parents for eight months, who was in America, were like, we miss you, we're so proud, whatever you do, we're very proud. And I thought that was like unbelievable from Lee Clark. Like it just gave you that loving feeling before the game and it kind of relaxed us a little bit. So the build up to that was, was, uh, was emotional, but, it was well worth it in the end. Uh, the actual game was really good. We went down 2-0. Uh, Ex-Swindon, actually. Big, and I went on to play with big Lukas Djokovic. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he scored to make it 2-0 and was celebrating as if he'd won the World Cup. So I'd reminded, my, reminded him of that when he came back <laughs> to Birmingham. We nearly enough relegated us. Uh, but yeah, we went 2-0 down. We got a goal with 12 minutes to go. Nikola Zygic scored. And then the 93rd minute, I, just, I actually started that game and centre mid so the last 10 minutes I, I just played up front so we're just trying to go for everything I just remember some crossing uh, Big Ziggy just headed it and people still say it might have been over the line but I'm determined it wasn't because uh, and then Tim Reans uh, headed it off the line I just I can still picture it I can still hear it just nod the ball into the net run away with my top off and I run straight to Darren Randolph because Darren Randolph had made a, a mistake for the second goal and was like crying his eyes out, devastated, thought that was us finished. So always I had that in my head, so I run all the way up to him, celebrated with him and just hearing that roar and oh, the scenes after wasn't everybody who gone about and think the scenes after the game were like ridiculous, but honestly if it went into the dressing room and there wasn't a word spoken for it's pr- it probably lasted about a minute and a half, but it seemed about ten minutes. No one said a word. It was just such a relief. Like, it was so quiet for, as I said, it was probably about 90 seconds, but it felt like 10 minutes. It was just that relief and the pressures that we, we all felt deep down. Uh, the manager sitting in the corner and, and tears and the pressure we all went through. And listen, it was just a great moment. And obviously, we scored that goal with 12 minutes to go. And the first thing we heard was supporters. Supporters were unbelievable. They were right through the season. Like, Trying to get us over the line, they were they were a, a massive part. Well, I, 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 you're not aware of this as a footballer, but you know every, there have been a load of watch, Swindon fans watching that that day, and of course you are our player. You know, you, you, whether yeah. you like it or not, you're forever our player. So, you know, for you to do something like that, we're celebrating with you. So you have that on your on your side. What a great yeah. moment! And I guess you know, in terms of your career, that's right up there, isn't it? I would imagine. Yeah, it's right up there. Obviously, the Barcelona one we've touched on, the, the two league titles, uh, playing for my country. Mm. Uh, but listen, I always, I said this the other day, I keep going back to the kids, it's because I'm coaching with them now, and you just want, as a footballer, you just want to leave your mark. You just want to be remembered for some. You just want to just, you don't want to just sail through your career, five, six hundred appearances, not make a mark at any club. And hopefully, every club I've been at, I've, well, some of them have at least, if it's not me going away with personal memories, then I've left people with, with memories, obviously, winning two league titles with Swindon, uh, scoring that goal for, for Birmingham, playing for my, my national team, playing in the Champions League, playing for my boyhood club, getting promoted with Blackburn. And 
yeah, and you just want to leave with something. So hopefully I've done that. I think you've done that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about that um, De Canio season. I know you've been into great length about that, but yeah, a, a, an extraordinary uh, season. And <laughs> many people are saying, was he as we thought he was? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You know what I mean here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, my experience of him was you didn't interview him. You sort of asked him a question and 20 minutes later, you asked him another one. You know, it, it, it yeah. was that simple, really. And as we all know, it was a bit of a dog's breakfast of a start. But it seemed to all turn around for me when I sat the afternoon at Accrington when a certain goalkeeper shipped up and things started to fall into place. Is that kind of how you felt? Yeah, spot on. Uh, I said that the other day when I'd done, done a podcast as well that Wes was a massive massive difference yeah I mentioned this again I, I probably went through my full career with he was probably one of two goalies that every time the ball went over the top or the, or the defensive line get broke I never thought the, the, the striker would score I always with Wes we always had confidence in him which then put confidence in us in a back four which then just feeds through the team because the midfield four of them get confidence in us as a back four We've then got confidence in them. They've got confidence in the striker, etc. So it just feeds right through the through the team. So that probably goes back to touching on that confidence thing as well. Mm -hmm. So we had confidence in Wes. Wes had confidence in us, and it just filtered through the team. But honestly, he was he was first class. He was brilliant. He, he always seemed to me to be the keeper that if he was beaten, he was beaten. Uh, but his positioning was first class, wasn't it? And yeah. It would have, it took something quite special to. I mean, he's having a terrific time at Sheffield United. He's been at Rangers, yeah. of course. Yeah. Wonderful footballing career. Is that fair to say then? He his positioning was was exemplary. And yeah. If he was beaten, it took something quite special to beat him. Yeah, he was always he held quite a high line as well, Wes, which which helped us anything over the top. He was always there to sweep up. Uh, communication, even at that young age, communication skills were brilliant. He what. You don't see a lot of goalies do it, but he would come come and collect crosses. He would come for corners. Just takes massive pressure off his. Uh, his distribution is a lot better now than it used to be. I remember under Mark Cooper, they'd done a lot of work with his distribution, but that was never a problem because we always seemed to have the ball. So the distribution thing didn't come into it much with him. He, he uh, as long as he could kick it, it was fine, basically. Uh, but yeah, he was a massive, massive help that year. So things started to go well and incredibly well, I think it's fair to say. When did you first think, right, actually the De Canio plan is now working? I mean, you know, we all knew that you had about 25 players sitting in the stand <laughs> that yeah. you never kicked a ball. I remember Maddie Caruso disappeared down the tunnel at Colchester one Saturday afternoon and we never saw him again. Never seen him again. Yeah. No, it was, it was extraordinary. Purely, I, think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was an FA Cup tie at Colchester and he, down he went down the tunnel and Oh, he's gone down the top. And that was it. And and your time with the Canio was up once it was up, wasn't it? That yeah, was you, that was that was it. It's absolutely spot on. You couldn't if you ever were on the wrong side of the Canio, you were finished, regardless of who you were. That was just the way it worked. Uh the turning point for me, you'll probably remember it well, Vic. We played Crawley away and we battered them yeah, 3 yeah. 0 Yeah, yeah. Battered them. Like they were flying at the time, a big, strong boy stressed outfit. Steve Evans in charge. There was all the the back and forth with, with Steve Evans and the manager beforehand in the press and we weren't doing so good. I think it was quite early in the season and I remember when, like everyone had wrote us off even laying a glove on them. They were bigger, they were stronger but we were fitter and more better on the floor but we, uh, I think we went into the league quite early. I think it might have been two or three up even in the first half and that's when we went into the dressing room afterwards and thought these are steamrolling teams at the moment. They're big, they're strong, they're physical. Exactly what you... The, the personalities and the credentials that you would associate with winning League 2. Big, strong, physical. You know, it's like a horrible league, as people say. But we were doing it a different way. And that's probably that moment I remember in the dressing room where we got back in the bus as well and we're like, yeah, we can win this league by playing good football, progressive football, getting in people's faces putting crosses in the box, doing a bit of both, like working really hard, but being effective with the ball. And that was the one for me that I thought, yeah, th we, we could do something this year. I didn't know exactly what we could do, but I knew that we'd be all right. I, I One player that never gets mentioned, but I, I kind of always think is incredibly important to that squad, and, and one Paul Benson, who to me, 
yeah, I always remember one game at Morecambe when um, it was close towards the end of the game and Paul Benson chased the ball down to make sure that they couldn't make anything of that. And I just thought, you know what? That's a footballer for me. Somebody who, who will give everything for that red shirt. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I, I always bring Paul Benson up. When I, Paul Benson was an unbelievable professional. He uh, was an amazing teammate. He would do anything for the dressing room. Uh, worked tirelessly. He was older. He was probably the oldest at the time as well. Uh, mm -hmm. A great example for the rest of us. And yeah, Benno was, was brilliant. Come up with some really important goals for us. Was uh, very effective, as you said, and and how he worked. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because he deserves as much credit as everyone else that season. Yeah, and of course, he got the winner against Wigan, although it was Matt Richie's shot, but he got the deflection, didn't he? Yeah, the offside deflection. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter. It put you into the no. fourth round of the FA yeah. Cup. Who cares? You're right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was a wonderful season, and um, I know you've spoken at great length about it. But that day, ten years ago which is phenomenal, really, when you lifted that trophy, Simon Ferry in his underwear, all that kind of thing. I, yeah. I, it, it struck me that you are a you are a band of brothers at the time and you still are. Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. Uh, listen, I said earlier that you, you want to leave your mark in football, but there's, I remember Richie Welland saying it when we'd won the league a couple of years ago that there's something special about a group of players that win, win stuff together. You always stay in contact and you always have that conversation breaker really if you've not seen someone for a couple of years or whatever it's like remember that time in that dressing room remember that game and yeah it's something that will that will bond us for the rest of the rest of our lives uh but yeah going back to that day it was just everything just seemed to go our way like that's through our own doing though we deserved it to go our way like just the simple things like we turned up and the sun was splitting the trees it was a lovely day with the atmosphere the flags were out the like a carnival atmosphere, everybody was buzzing. Uh, we go on and we're probably the performance of the season, to be honest. We were amazing in that game, amazing. Scored some unbelievable goals. Matt Richie scored a great goal. Uh, size played a little flick around the corner to Paul Benson, who's dinked it over the goalie. Uh, and then just the, just the scenes at the end were ridiculous, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, they were, and they're on that picture behind me, which uh, everybody will remember uh, uh, for the rest of their lives. You were there, and of course, you had the party on the park. Were you at the party on the park? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the Carney was up singing "Dancing yeah, yeah, in the Moonlight." Yeah. With yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, did you ever fancy singing something like that in front of a crowd? Was that your thing or not? Uh, listen, if I'm asked to go and do a sing song, I'm, I'm happily obliged, but I'm not very good. <laughs> and your taste in music is what exactly? What would you uh, perform? <sighs> Well, my, my initiation song's always been uh, Saturday Night at the Movies, All Robson right. and Jerome. Oh, I was going to say The Drifters, but I'm older than you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Robson <laughs> and Jerome at the time, yeah. That was always my that was my go-to, yeah. All right, okay, fair enough. I won't ask you to give us a bit of a... Well, it's up to you whether you want to or not. Nah, at the end. I'll, leave, no, I'll no. leave it out. We'll leave save that one out. See if everybody's ears. Okay, the following season, of course, Swindon do rather well, don't they? Um, it appears. Um, Tranmere Rovers away on a Tuesday night, go to the top of the league. Um, that was the day after we, the week we played late Orient at nil nil on a Tuesday night, uh, if I remember rightly. Matt Ritchie had gone off to Bournemouth, and that was the day De Canio was in a Swindon dugout for the final time, wasn't it? If you remember right. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I actually spoke to Matty. Matty was one of these players that he would always come to me for advice. I was the same age. Well, not I think. A year or two, I don't care. I don't even know the age difference, but I think I was I wasn't much an age gap between us. I wasn't any more experienced, but he just just always came to me. He always thought I gave good advice. He always trusted everything I said. And I remember him phoning me saying, uh, "Can I think the canny was going to resign?" And I was like, "Why?" Because I'd obviously went to Birmingham at the time. Basically, it was because of him, and he felt really guilty. And I'm like, "Matt, it's not your problem. Like the club have accepted a bid for you. It's out your hands." So. And Matty obviously had a great relationship with the Canio, but the Canio was phoning Matty saying, if you leave, then I'm I'm going to leave this club. So Matty felt like a massive like pressure. And I'm like, it's not your issue. It's completely out of your hands. It's between the manager and the club. So don't let it bother you. And it eventually came round to the fact that he's in a position where the club have accepted a bid. So basically, they're happy for him to move on. But the manager wants him to stay. So it was like, what does he do? So eventually he's left. Obviously, the manager has then 
then resigned or been sacked, whatever happened, and they went top of the league when Fab took over, didn't they, for that game? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think Fab might be um, watching tonight. So if you are, Fab, hello to you. Nice to, to have you along. And uh, we did a lovely chat with him a couple of years, well, a year or so ago. And he speaks very fondly of you and people like Matt Ritchie and things like that. And, you know, in terms of uh, moving on and your return to Swindon, I remember one afternoon at Salford, there'd been a rumour that you were coming back and then you were on the bench at Salford, weren't you? And you come on with yeah. about two minutes left. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, just before that, the, maybe two weeks before that, I was training. Uh, Owen Doyle had, had phoned me and said that Richard, would, Richard Wellens would like me to come down and train. So I came and trained, and, and to be fair to the gaffer, he told me from day one he's trying to move players on. Uh, he'd love to do a deal, but there's nothing there at the moment. So I just kept training. I think I trained for about 10 days. Uh, and then eventually he rung me Wednesday or something. As, without getting into detail, like when I spoke about not playing football for money, I come back to Swindon, and for the first, and Richie Wellens will back this up, for the first five, six months if I come back. So probably to the end of the no from the November to the end of January, sorry, so three, four months. I was I, I was paying out my own pocket to come and like right. travel expenses, etc. There was no money at the club. They couldn't move people on, etc. So and I was happy to do that. And that's me, you know, that's me just trying to back up like I'm not I'll just all talk about it. footballs are all about money and it wasn't. It was about I would have sounds cheesy, but I wouldn't have done that for any other club but Swindon because I knew that I had a connection there and listen another thing people I think the modern day see if somebody does something well on the pitch I feel as if like fans might applaud it but teammates won't like make a make a fuss of it it's like the other day we done something with, at Fleetwood and, and that's what I'm trying to pass on is like make people feel good so I felt good coming back to Swindon because I knew the Swindon supporters would make me feel good so that's the reason I first of all came back but uh, yeah, eventually signed the late Thursday night in a hotel in Salford. I drove down from Scotland, and uh, the manager had said, "Listen, just just come. We might see how it's going. We might put you on for like a couple of minutes." I hadn't played a game for six, seven months since the, the previous season. So I had uh, left Bradford, and I, I I didn't have anything. So uh, yeah, just signed the the Thursday night. Came back, was on the bench, and. Come on, the last two minutes. Can see yeah, that I remember thing. that. Yeah, I we remember can... you. And another thing I remember is you came over and talked to some of the fans who were leaving the ground, and I just thought, yeah, yeah you're home, really. I, I just kind yeah. of had that feeling. Uh, and when you walked into that dressing room, did you think, yep, this is a team that can do well? Oh, I'd been training with them for a week, so I knew. Yeah, I knew there was a lot of good players there, uh, and I started to get a feel for the style of play that the manager had. And I'll be honest, it was an absolute. I'm training that week and, and they're doing shape and stuff like that and I'm at the side at times where we know Hunt because the boys are doing their shape for the for the match that I've, obviously I'm not involved in and, and Hunt is even saying to me like this is a dream for you like this suits you down to a tee full backs getting high coming inside getting on the ball I'm like oh, I would love it and he's like Hunt is like just stick with it we'll, we'll work something out so once I seen that like shape and the way they train and stuff like that, I was desperate to work under the manager the manager was first class like so detailed, attention to detail, knew everything about the opposition, set us up for if they went a three four three, if they then switched to four four two, this is what we're going to do. Just so meticulous and everything he'd done. He was first class and absolutely loved coming back. So uh, there we are. We're, 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 it's a fantastic season and it all is going well, isn't it? And it, it, it's wonderful. We're getting great crowds and we've got four or five home games to go before you know, at the end of the season, you're expecting double figure crowds for all that kind of thing. And then it all finishes um, very abruptly. Yeah. I remember one Friday afternoon, I was out mowing the lawn and I found out that Swindon won the League Two Championship. Now, yeah. That's not how you find out your football team wins a League Two Championship, is it? So where were you when you found out that? Similar. It wasn't quite mowing the lawn, but I was back in, uh, back in Scotland at the time at my parents' house just uh, we were staying there for a little bit my my partner my kids my mum and dad and we got a message on the group chat to say the manager had been been uh, putting on Zoom calls just chatting see how we all are what we're up to and all that. so we just thought it was another general Zoom call Zoom call tonight 8pm 
So uh, the managers came on and he, he's just talking away and he's like, right lads, I think it's time to tell. He's like, uh, unfortunately they've gave crew the league title because they've went down that route, they've down, down that route, etc. And we're all absolutely devastated. And he's just pulled out this bottle of champagne and popped it and went, only joking, we're champs. <laughs> and we're all absolutely buzzing. Like, So that's how we found out, before, obviously before everyone else found out, but that's how... That's how we found out as a team, and you could just hear everybody screaming and shouting, and oh, it was amazing. You could see like all the lads' kids on the background jumping and dancing. It was just like it was probably the best way it could possibly happen with us all being together, but not yeah, and and person, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean there were some wonderful moments. Uh, you know, Plymouth way on a New Year's Day, things like that. There were some incredible moments that season, weren't there? And, yeah. You know, it, it just became this wonderful, wonderful... Uh, the football was great too, wasn't it? It wasn't yeah. you know, clogging football. It was great football to watch. Oh, it was amazing to play in. Honestly, it was amazing. I remember after a couple of weeks, like, on Doyle sent me as well, you will love, like, the style was amazing. Like, it was something that I'd never seen before. I'd never seen fullbacks take those positions or anything like that. Or central midfielders peel in. And I just think, how's that going to work? And then once you actually play in it, to play in it was a joy, an absolute joy. And you can understand why Owen Doyle scored so many, mm. so many goals. We created so many chances. We uh, we never changed wherever we went. That's that's how we played. I remember playing away to Grimsby. We were like two or three up early doors, but the pitch was terrible. Yeah. And the manager's like, I trust you. Just try and play the style, and we'll get there. And we did. And it was it was honestly it was first class. Freezing cold day, if I remember rightly. At yeah, it was cold. Eh? Yeah, it was cold. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that season comes to an end, and in total contrast to the scenes on that picture behind me, you get presented. I think it was a Friday with a trophy with nobody in the ground. Uh, what was the contrast like? I'll be honest, I was crap. Hated it because I had experience before, mm. so that helped. Uh, well, no, sorry, that didn't help. It made it worse. Yeah. And I just, I remember holding the trophy in my hand and thinking the last time I'd done this, that was full, that was full, that was full, that was full. Like just standing in the stadium, we had to stand two metres apart from each other. So you've obviously, everyone has seen the pictures. So there's one person standing there, there's another one two metres away. And it's, I understand why it had to happen. Mm. Totally get it, the people losing their life, I would never, never go against what was happening. But that was probably the most disappointing thing. It was, disappointing is the wrong word, it was sad. We were sad that that's the way that we had to celebrate, and I think it's sad for us fans as well because we oh, never had we never hundred percent, hundred percent. They got us. Do you know the month that I always go back to in in that season was January. We had a, a massive January. We lost Owen Doyle yeah. and got him back. We lost Jerry Yates, got him back. But we played like Exeter at home. I played centre back with Anthony Grant and Tom yeah. Broadbent. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a depleted squad. We then. We won that game. We beat Crew. We then went away to Plymouth. So that was three of our like teams that were up there fighting with us. We got victories against them. Uh, yeah, we beat them all, didn't we? Yeah, Not we Crew, Exeter, and Plymouth, wasn't it? Well, well, Plymouth was New Year's Day, so that was the last day. Owen Doyle scored the winner. Yeah, and then and I think you knew he was going. Yeah, we knew he was going. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Was it, yeah. yeah. So it was just yeah. that month was huge for us. Uh, so like you don't. You don't be successful on your own. You need like so the supporters got us over the line a lot of times, and I just thought, again, I had experienced that and seen everyone that happy and stuff like that at the club, and to not share it with them was was a travesty. So to the following season then, and goodness me, what a bizarre season! I mean, you know, living in Devon and not travelling home and away with town with the town, all I did was I got the laptop out, plugged it into the telly and watch the spinning white circle on iFollow. And it was just so bizarre. And we managed to get to watch two games with, I think it was Fleetwood at home yeah. and Charlton at home. But there was a limit of 2,000, I think. Yeah. And how was that as a footballer? I, I would imagine, you know, hey, I played Sunday league football in front of two men and a dog, and the dog wasn't interested. But, you know, what was it like for a professional footballer? Oh, absolutely hated it. Hated it. Probably another reason why my conscience had went as well. And I said, you've obviously seen me play plenty of times, but I like to I feed off the crowd. I like to get people going. I'm I'm one of those players that will try and not wind like well yeah wind the whole position fans up. I'll 
my game management stuff like that will annoy people I'll take my time and I feed off that and I'll be honest we used to walk out that tunnel and it'd be like the best way for me to describe it was like getting a sponge dipping it in water and then just squeezing it we walked out the pitch and that energy was just squeezing right out of us we were, there were we had meetings like the Friday before games like we're going to play 80% noise of the crowd in the background over the speakers and it was just it was rubbish absolutely hated it hated it grew up playing in front of supporters for 15 16 years and you know what I always said like Matt, Matt Smith's an unbelievable player really good player like that year but that probably helped him that was his first year playing senior football so to speak and it was probably similar to what he'd have been used to at Arsenal playing under 20s and stuff like that but that's probably why he was a shining light but I don't mean that disrespectful to him because he's an unbelievable talent he done he was amazing for us but the ones that struggled myself in particular there was a lot of experienced players that did struggle that year and I think it can be down to that I, I hated it absolutely hated it I don't know how any other way to describe it I hated everything about that year I've got to ask you the John Sheridan question because many yeah. people have asked that. Um, was it as bad as people make out? Uh, results were bad, yeah, but listen, John, John Sheridan had a lot to deal with as well yeah. off the pitch. Oh, yeah. he, uh, he he lost both parents, so I don't know how that feels and I would never, ever put myself in that position and tell you exactly how it felt because I don't know, so... You've got to remember that first and foremost. Uh, I understand he didn't have a great relationship with supporters. I get that. Uh, but he had a lot of things, I think, to deal with behind the scenes as well that not a lot of people know. Like, we were playing Wimbledon away, for example, uh, on the Saturday half five kickoff. You remember it got changed mm. to half five. Mm. Uh, we, we were travelling on the day. We couldn't get a bus there on time. So we ended up almost late for the game so the preparation which was out of John Sheridan's hands stuff upstairs uh, we were travelling four I think it took four or five hours to get to Ipswich on the day albeit we went and won but yeah. just the preparations weren't great uh, problems with food that we were having to get Fratello's twice three times a week just to feed us uh, just loads of little things were starting to to come away, the manager couldn't get the players in that he wanted, hence why I think Richie Wellens had left as well, there was embargoes, there was just everything that could go wrong, went wrong that year, simple as that, players weren't good enough, manager didn't do well enough as, as well as he would have wanted to do, the club didn't support management and players, for me I just, I think we're set up to fail for for that, that season to be honest, we had the uh, there was like there was a breakdown inside the club basically the, the supporters obviously didn't like what was going on with the owners the owners was then having to cut stuff which would then affect the manager the manager would then get peed off which would this is Wellens as well this is John Sheridan would then get peed off with players because he's having to play players that he doesn't particularly want at the club he wants his own players in he can't get his own players then again he's pissed off the owner just a circle of negativity constantly and you get what you deserve in a 46, 48 game season. Yeah, it was a nightmare really and um, what have you thought of, I've got loads of questions for you so we'll get yeah. to them in a minute because I'm aware that people want them answered. So, um, uh, This is from James Spencer actually. Uh, Paul, one of my favourite STFC players, can I ask him, John Sheridan, what was all that about? Why do you think he failed so miserably? So I think you just pretty much Answered that question. Yeah. Um, Tony Goff, uh, just loved it, Paul. Matt Ritchie playing together, more than solid than a brick wall. Great communication between them. And I think that came across too. Didn't it? I mean, Matt Ritchie, I know because I spoke to him about this. De Canio made such a difference to his game, didn't he? Because he, yeah. if you remember rightly, he came initially on loan, I think, under Danny Wilson. And yeah, he did. Yeah. It, it, it didn't really, didn't really yeah, never... do a lot. No. And then, well, we all know the player he became. Well, he went on like you to play for Scotland, which is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had, an he had a great relationship with the Canio. The Canio, the Canio got as, as fit as... There's not one player in that 
team that that done pre season under the can would have said they'd been f- mm-hmm. any fitter throughout their career. There was the fittest we'd ever been. Uh but we built up a great relationship off the pitch as well and Matty's partner and my partner we used to all, all meet up and stuff like that. And Sai obviously live Sai and his partner live with and where myself, my partner for six months. I had Rafa De Vita and Matia living with me for three, four months. Uh so we had a great like camaraderie off the pitch as well. So the relationship I had with Matty and, and Sai in particular and just, just happened that we all played on that right side. It was me on the right back, Sai and inside right, uh Matty playing wide right with we, we a great relationship and it was a it was a joy to play with because I knew I passed it inside to Sai and he would look after the ball. He would always make the right decision. He would then go to Matty. My job was easier. My job was easy because I had day two in front. Matty would come inside, either score a worldie or slip me in. So they two made me better. Yeah, wonderful to watch as well. Uh, Rich James, this is from Rich. Two bits here, and, and I was going to ask you about this question, so you can ask this one. He says, will you come back to Swindon? Well, we'll get onto that in a minute. But what do you think about Swindon this season? I know you've worked a lot with Horsey and you've seen yeah. a lot of games. So what do you think of them this season? What, what I mean, you know, two disappointing results over Easter in terms of Newport and Leighton Orient against Richie Wellens. Um, otherwise, you know, the home form has been miserable, let's be honest. Yeah. The away form has been excellent. Why is that, do you think? What, what, what is the difference? Well, as, as you said, I've been doing a lot of the, the commentary with, with Andrew. Uh, and <laughs> the ones that I go to are the ones up north. So it's always the away game. So I've not really seen many home games, but it's difficult to put your put your finger on exactly like, why you don't do as well at home as you do away, but going off like the the season as a whole, I, I was worried. To be honest, when they lost uh, Tyree Simpson, hmm. I thought Tyree Simpson was very hmm. effective. Him and Harry McCurdy were striking up a great relationship. The the old school like little and large combination. He's not a huge guy, but he's physically strong, hmm. which I think Harry McCurdy enjoyed playing round about and behind etc. So I was worried round about then when, when they didn't quite replace and I know they brought Josh Davison in and people can say it's a like for like but for me I don't think it Different is. Different sort of player isn't he? Yeah I totally agree I, I don't think they're like for like that's not taking anything away for Josh no. Davison because no, no. he's done really well he works really hard but I thought even when Tyree Simpson was at the club and I remember saying it in commentary a few times I think he was underused I think you've got like there was times where it's a style of play they get. Uh, they play it, and I totally get it. They work on it religiously, day by day. So why would you change what the players know? There's just times where you've probably seen it yourself. Probably pulling your hair out, Vic, when they're passing it across the back four, and you think, oh, oh they're just about to get in, and then they just get there. And I think there was times where they could have played those first couple of passes, and then that opens the space up to go into Tyrese because he was big and physical, and he would look after it. So I thought he was underused at times, but. He was very effective. I really liked him. Well, 11 goals before Christmas, that says it all. I mean, it's not that yeah. young kid who's never played football before at that level. Exactly. Um, Jason says, Cads, I want to apologise for telling you to tell Danny Rose to calm down when he'd just been booked against Northampton, only for George to get sent off two minutes later. So there you are. There's a, a um, <laughs> <laughs> an apology for you. Uh, no, Danny, right. Danny says, town legend and great servant to the club. Such a shame your career finished on a low last year. Would have been great if you had been playing a part this season. Uh, we've already mentioned those. Uh, Dion Conroy, that, it's interesting because, you know, I, I I, hate it when players get abused. I just, uh, I don't see the point. And it goes back to the confidence thing. You know, if you're going through a rough time, the last thing you want to do is have the crowd tell you you're going through a rough time, isn't it? I yeah. mean, because yeah. that makes you do exactly what you were saying earlier, overplay and make it too complicated. Yeah, of course. Listen, it's... It's difficult. You, uh, listen, every player will look at themselves first and foremost. They should do, in my opinion. They'll, they'll look in before they look out. So, Dion Conroy's wise enough to know when he's played well and when he hasn't played well. He's wise enough now to turn a blind eye to negative comments if that's what he, that's if, on social media and stuff like that. So, I think he'll be absolutely fine. He's, uh, I think he's picked up the last few weeks, has he? Yes, he has. Yeah, done a lot better the last couple of weeks. So. Uh, yeah, so he'll need the backing of the supporters. He'll touched on it earlier again, and it's everybody wants to hear nice things. So when he does something nice, then get behind him, and I'm sure it's exactly what's happening at the moment. 
Well, that performance Tuesday night against Forest Green would have helped, which was uh, yeah. quite extraordinary. Matthew Baldry, who's thinking of packing up this season, is playing like Virgil van Dijk at the minute. It's incredible. Um, yeah. And it's nice to see a, an experienced player, shall we say, who's had his injury problems, going yeah. through a pretty good time. So good on him. Yeah. Um, what about this season? Because would you have liked to have been part of it? I mean, was there ever a chance you might have been? Or was that it at the end of the season? What, what no, there was never there was never a part of it, to be honest. Uh, no conversation was ever taking place. I was I'd never heard from anyone till from the end of last season when Mildy had let us know that we weren't staying. But I'd already had an idea anyway because uh, the club were trying to get me get me out in the January anyway. But I wanted to stay and just see it out to the end of the season. Yeah. Um, what, uh, James says one goal conceded at home in eighteen games under De Canio in League Two. Pretty good record and. You know, your defence in West Fodringham has a great deal to do with that, of course. Um, Sean says, I can never get over why Andrew Black pulled the plug so soon uh, to the end of the season. We would have been in the Championship and surely would have been better to sell up then. Kevin says, would you be manager of Swindon one day? Um, and we'll get to that in just a second. Rob says, great interview. Thanks for everything, Cads. Best for the future. And Mike says, Paul, you were a great pro and servant to the club. So then. Let's come up to date. You're coaching at Fleetwood. Congratulations yeah. on getting your latest badges. Thank uh, you. Which is fantastic. That puts you in a position to what? To get to be uh, a coach at a football club, a manager? Where does that put you? Yeah, I think you, as long as you've got your B licence and working towards your A, uh, which I will be, then you can manage, yeah. Uh, absolutely loving my time coaching. Uh, I'm one of those guys, Vic, I put all my eggs in one basket. So I'm all in with the coaching. I, I love it. I'll, I do a lot of stuff at home. I analyse a lot of stuff. I watch a lot of like our games that we play and analyse players and help them. And I just love like try to pass on my experiences, help people. And uh, yeah, it's something I'm really looking forward to. It's the very start of my journey, but hopefully a long, successful one. So, what sort of job would you take? I mean. Um... Uh, how low down the pyramid would you want to go? If you know, if somebody say in the conference offered you a job, would you go for that or League Two? Where where would you think yeah. you start? Yeah, listen, it's all about opportunity in it. So if an opportunity comes up to to manage at any level, then then it's something I definitely want to do. I, I do feel like I think it's good to manage in in places where you can make mistakes and not not get found out if you know what I mean so you can yeah. in a place where I'm not in a massive like right now at the academy I can, I can make mistakes but they're not mistakes that are going to detriment the, the progress of the players I just mean like maybe making a pitch size in a training session five yards too big just little things like that just learning on the job uh, but not listen I'd start anywhere I'd, I just love I love what I'm doing right now uh, it's all a part time at the moment so Hopefully there might be something at the end of the season somewhere and we'll see. And I, I'm guessing you'd walk over hot coals to come to Swindon, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd... Oh, I'd walk to Swindon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. I'd, even as a youth team manager, academy manager, I would, uh, yeah, I'd love to get involved, obviously. Listen, it's Swindon's special for me. I've got an unbelievable relationship with, with the club. I've had, had great success there, so 100% I'd come back and... The what is eye. it about that club then? Because here you are, you're a boy who grew up in Kilmarnock, you know, and a, and a team in Wiltshire. What is it, do you think? What is that connection? Uh, I think the most important thing at football clubs is supporters, in it? And I, I touched on it earlier, like, I was brought up in a council estate by hard-working parents, so I think I've got that in me, and I, I don't care what club you are and what support of year. if you see someone put 100% in effort in every week in a shirt that you absolutely love and you pay for just to go and see then you're giving them something back straight away and I always think I don't think there's any supporter out there and I hope there's not that would ever say I'd never gave any more than 100 uh, any less than 100% that was me that was just and I think that's the best way it's not about scoring 10 goals in 15 games obviously that's great but I think supporters just appreciate work ethic and and showing that like I care for that club, I care for those supporters because I'm in that jersey and they're they're coming to watch me and I'm going to give everything I possibly can to make those supporters happy and repay their, their faith. 
Well, I think you've done that many, many times, Paul, if I might say so. And it's been a great pleasure talking to you tonight because, you know, there are certain players over the years that you watch and <laughs> got a comment here from Anne. Is Clem listening? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he might be. You never know. Uh, you know, there are certain players over the years who you look back with great fondness on and you are certainly up there for many, Thanks, many man. people who watch Swindon. And uh, it will always be that way. And there is a uh, there is a song, as you know, about our certain dear beloved neighbours at the A420. Do you hate them? Is that fair to say or not? I don't like them. That's very, no. very no. fair, yeah. <laughs> not at all. I was actually watching them last week when they're praying that Scott Twain would do something. <laughs> now, he's a kiddie, isn't he? I tell you what, he's oh, a player. Yeah, top player. Top player. He's got a right good chance of going to the next level and then the next. Hmm. Top kid as well. Willing yeah. to listen, willing to learn. Yeah, great pro. Wish him all the best. I'll tell you what, Paul, I, I, Chris is back, and I know Chris has been looking forward to this for a long time, and uh, she's a bit of a fan, if I might put it like No, that. I'm not. No. <laughs> <laughs> he knows that. <laughs> it's been great. I really, really loved it, and thank you very much indeed. For no problem at all. It's been great. Anytime. You know, Anytime. You know you've got to do other things as well, so I really appreciate your yeah. time. Thank yeah, that's you. Fine. No, no problem. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks so much, Paul. No problem. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll have you on again sometime. Maybe when we've won at Wembley or something, we can get you back on. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> touch wood, touch wood. So, but brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, thank you for all the questions. I did try and get everything through. I was a bit distracted, so I might not have worked as hard as I should have done. But uh, but I tried to get everything through. So. Um, but thank you very much. We will be back Monday. So uh, we've got Barrow on Saturday, Saturday. So we're back Monday night with the Monday night panel. And we have got um, a special appearance by Joe Tomlinson, yeah. uh, which will be really nice to hear from him before uh, he goes back. So that will be fantastic. So thank you for watching. Thanks again, Paul. Take care. Hope everything works out for you everywhere. And we will see you all soon. Thank you.